In the last couple of years, three new car makers have announced their entry into the Indian car market, Kia, Citroën and MG. Now, the only thing that's busier than the Indian car market is the SUV space between the 10 to 30 lakh rupee bracket. Now, that's a wide bracket, but all these three car makers have said that they will begin their innings in this particular space. And to that effect, they've created a lot of noise about the vehicles that they'll begin their innings with. But the MG Hector, that's the one that has garnered the most amount of interest from the Indian audience. Partly because of the way it looks, partly because of the novelty that it brings to the table with the whole internet car thing. You've probably already seen the car a lot of times. You've already even read about what these connected technologies are all about and what they have to offer. But today, finally, we are driving the MG Hector. We'll be putting all these features to test to find out how everything works in the Indian scheme of things. Let us begin with the form of the car. It appears long, has the heft of a 30 lakh rupee SUV and in terms of its dimensions, it's longer than the XCV 500 and both longer and taller than the Tata Harrier. But it certainly doesn't look as tall and that is down to those puny 17 inch wheels. This one certainly deserves 19 inches and fat rubber as well, fatter than the 215 section tyres that it already has. That would go with the heft of this car. To put things into perspective, it is a size smaller than the Tata Hexa but larger than the Hyundai Tusa and almost comparable to the Skoda Kodiak. It has a smart looking face that instantly draws your attention. The large MG logo takes centre stage on the imposing upright grille while the Morris Garage's insignia on the rub rails is a good touch to explain what the MG logo stands for for those who don't know them yet. But the Internet Inside badge that highlights the USP of the Hector seems a bit tacky to me. So while the brand finds its roots in Britain, things like these highlight the Chinese connection. The MG Hector it began life as a Baojun 530, which is a Chinese car. But then it has been modified heavily adapted for the Indian conditions. Now one common question is, does this car feel Chinese? The short answer to that is no. The long answer to that is, despite a few cost-saving measures like using a petrol tachometer in a diesel or inconsistent shut lines or panel gaps, it still feels like a very solidly built product. The Hector is available in four trims and while all sit on the same wheel sizes for all the trims, the ground clearance ranges from 191mm on the base models to 198mm for the range toppers. I like the designs and layouts of all the exterior lighting that has been used on the Hector and they also boast that they are all LED. On the base variant as well, you get LED DRLs. So the only bulb, the regular bulb that you get is in the fog lamps. Apart from that, the LED DRLs stay, so the look of the car is maintained. I also like the fact that this satin finish on the grille actually looks quite good. So if you don't like too much bling, you have the option of going with a satin finish as well. In fact, accessorization is going to be a very big deal uh, for the Hector as well. In terms of design, I think even for the base variant, it looks just as imposing, just as smart as its higher variants. On the inside, there are a few changes, like the inlays, they are not leather. The upholstery is not leather, but what they've used in terms of the fabric materials, it looks quite good, it looks quite smart, looks quite upmarket as well. And you still continue to get that huge screen even in the base variant, which is again a very good thing. You do not get, however, the internet facilities, you do not get the connected technologies that the higher variants are boasting of. Even the instrumentation, slightly different, you lose out on the full colour multi-info display, but the clocks, though simple, are quite easy to read. The trendy new headlights in the bumper design look smart, but the tail can be a bit polarising. The seamless strips of lights and reflectors in the bumpers as well as the tailgate seems a bit overdone. And then there are the two exhaust ports in the bumper, only one of which gets the functional exhaust tip. Of course, they've tried to make it look sporty, but probably using a downward-facing hidden exhaust tip would have allowed the designers to make the bumper look better, more aesthetically balanced. Also, there are lighting elements in all the four corners of the car, usually in places where people pick up dings and dangs. So you have to be particularly careful while driving this car. Also, you need to have a very good judgement of all the four corners. At least while reversing though, the systems have you covered with a 360-degree camera view that is all the more easier to read with a screen that is so large. 10.4 inches to be precise. And the tacky internet inside badge on the outside, well, it points to this screen and the infotainment software that powers it. And that is what creates headlines for this MG. 
For starters, using a phone app, you can remotely lock or unlock the car, even if you are not in the same city as your car, courtesy the Internet of Things. Similarly, you can also check the status of your car, its mechanical health, fuel level, etc. or simply spook out parking attendants by remotely opening or closing the sunroof. All you need is network on your phone and network on this infotainment device. As of now, it comes courtesy of Airtel and Embedded SIM and MG pays for that internet. It's free of cost for the user. Also, this app has a few niggles. Uh, like for example, it will attempt to close the sunroof twice before allowing you to open it again. But it is more of a teething issue and something that I believe will be solved with software updates. And speaking of software updates, even the infotainment software can be updated over the air. You will simply get a notification on top saying that there's an update available. And all you need to do is download the update using the data connection available on the device itself. That data connection also enables other internet-based services like music and entertainment apps, location tracking, geofencing, etc. It also allows you to remotely start the car and pre-cool the cabin on the automatic variant. Of course, most of this functionality is network dependent and still at a nascent stage. So things may or may not work as expected. Continuing with our question of does it feel Chinese? Well, it's very hard to write off this tablet as just another tablet full of features like a gimmicky Chinese gadget. There's a lot more to it. MG has ensured that it works with some very well-known partners to make sure that all these devices, all these features work reliably and for a long duration of time. So for example, the hardware, it comes from Panasonic. The Internet of Things, it's networked by Cisco. The weather information comes from AccuWeather. There's music from Ghana and the navigation system, it uses TomTom Tom maps. Now, the device, the layout, I think it's quite nice, it's quite intuitive, but sometimes when you're driving, sometimes when you have a long list of things in front of you and you may want to uh, do a selection, you sometimes wish that this round switch here could also double up as a rotary input device. Unfortunately, it doesn't do that. Even the volume is controlled via switches, the aircon is also on the device itself. There's also an always alert voice recognition that wakes up on saying, Hello MG. Hello, MG. Hi, how can I help? But like similar assistants, it can be intrusive at times when you're simply having a conversation with the other occupants and it's not entirely efficient at understanding Indian accents either. Could you play some new Bollywood music? Pardon? So is the internet car hype worth it? Yes, quite. The tablet plays video too and also hosts functions for the air conditioning, thereby reducing the switch gear clutter. But I wish that the space that it frees up in the center and the tunnel console was utilized better for accommodating knickknacks. Keeping a big phone isn't easy if the cup holders are being used. And wireless charging is missed in a car that is as tech savvy as this. The space management inside the boot? Not the best. If you raise the boot floor, you will see a lot of empty spaces underneath. Now, you can use it to store away something like uh, an air compressor or any additional tools if you have any. Uh, also, cars that do not have a subwoofer will give you an additional cavity here. So you can look at it two ways. Either it can be looked as something that's very versatile or something that's in a way a waste of space because that could have been used for better luggage space. You get a full-size spare wheel that's, that sits underneath and the hook for that is right here. But if you look closely enough, you will see these block off plates for what would have been seat belts. You also see hooks here. You see an odd placement for the stay for the cargo blind. And that is because this is already ready for a seven seater. A seven seater variant is expected sometime in 2020. Also, the Hector is the only car to get a power tailgate in this category. The next one being a Hyundai Tucson. The space management for the occupants is pretty good though. The front seats are wide and have a comfortable bolstering and depending on the trim, both of these can be had with powered adjustments. The first thing that you'll notice when you get inside the rear seat of the MG Hector is the amount of knee room that it offers. Plenty of it. You can cross your legs and sit if you like. This is set to my driving preference. If it's completely ret retracted back, it still has a decent amount of knee room, still decent amount of space. This one has been retracted back completely. The only grudge is if the driver is tall and completely sets the seat to its lowest position, then you may not be able to stretch out your feet for comfort, for long distance comfort. And you might have to sit with a slight bit of a knees up position. 
But if you look at the floor, it's completely flat. If three people get in here, it's going to be relatively more comfortable than vehicles that have that huge tunnel console running. Two adults and a kid would be good. Three adults in a squeeze will fit. It's quite comfortable. The seats are also quite comfortable. Uh, like I talked about the foot space for the front seat, the same can happen even for the passenger seat if you choose the hybrid variant because the battery pack for the hybrid sits under the front passenger seat and then it again robs it of any foot space. But apart from that, this is a lovely spacious place to be in. You get a charger at the back, you also have your rear AC vents and they're not very powerful but the overall circulation of the air conditioned air is quite decent. The visibility from the windows is quite good too. The rear seat can be reclined and gets three adjustable headrests and a three-point seat belt even for the middle row occupant, which is great. On the topic of safety, the MG Hector's standard safety kit is actually quite strong. You get disc brakes on all the four wheels, you get ABS, you get EBD, you get traction control, you get two front airbags. As you move higher up the order, the mid-level variant gets you four airbags, the top-end variant gets you six airbags. So in terms of the safety kit, it is quite well specced. Like the Ford EcoSport or the Hyundai Venue, there's also an e-calling function to aid faster emergency responses in case of an accident. The solidly built feel of the MG Hector adds a further sense of security to the cabin. I have mixed reactions about the instrumentation though. For starters, like I said, the tachometer is wrong. They've used the same one from the petrol engine. So even a diesel shows a red line at 6,500 RPM, which is not true. But what I like is how easy the multi-information display is and the amount of info that it shows. Just that both our test cars were inconsistent in pulling the navigation info on the display though. Not a great thing when you're using that to navigate. So you have to take your eyes off the road, go back into navigation and use the navigation on the tablet. It's not very convenient that way. So this is something that needs fixing. But then again, this is an internet car. If you have enough customers complaining about this, they might just fix it in a software update. The future is here. don't want to wait, you could simply use Apple CarPlay, which runs in landscape mode on the MG Hector and even shows Google Maps in a full-screen landscape mode, which is far more convenient to use. The MG Hector gives you a nice commanding view of the road from the driver's seat and the overall visibility is quite good too. The A pillar slightly on the thicker side but the cornering visibility is not hampered much. In fact, even the outside rear view mirrors, the wing mirrors, they are quite big but there is enough clearance around it to be able to give you a clear idea of where you're going. You, you are easily able to see where you're going. The contouring of the bonnet, it also tells you where the limits of the car are. So getting a judgment of the corners, not a problem at all. Like I said, the wing mirrors are quite big so they give you a good visibility of what's happening around you. So overall, this is a good driving Porsche. What could have been a little better, however, is the angle of the steering wheel. It's a little in my face, but it's adjustable for reach as well as uh, tilt, but that's only on the top end variants. The lower variants will not allow you telescopic adjustment. I like the way the steering has been tuned for the MG Hector. On the petrol variant, it feels a tad bit better. It is a little light, but it weighs up nicely, even around twisties. It feels quite good. It's not the most precise steering systems out there. There are better cars in this segment, but this one does a good job. It doesn't feel unnerving anywhere. It doesn't feel too vague. It doesn't feel unpredictable, and that's a good thing. This isn't a driver's car and more comfort-oriented instead, and therefore isn't as taut or as involving to drive as some of its rivals. But at the same time, it doesn't have the overly squishy nature typical to some Asian cars, and yet it manages to have a cushy ride. It even tackles broken roads quite well. For the size of this car, for the heft of this car, the braking manners are actually quite good. The brakes are not only progressive, they're very predictable and they don't feel spongy at all. The bite is confident, even with four people on board, full luggage on board. Never did feel that it needs a firmer push. It is just right there. The bite is just confidence inspiring and even around twisties or on the highway, it's just perfect. 
So full marks in terms of braking. The engine braking is slightly stronger on the mild hybrid variant. Speaking of which, there are three powertrain options to choose from. A 2-litre Fiat Source Turbo Diesel or a 1.5-litre four-cylinder turbo petrol with or without a mild hybrid system. The petrol engine, 1.5-litre. Sounds small, is small, but doesn't feel small. It doesn't feel inadequate. In fact, we've been driving with four people in the car with all our luggage and it has not really lost its breath anywhere. It doesn't feel like an inadequate engine, doesn't feel like a very small engine. Now, it's a turbocharged engine, of course. The turbocharging, it evidently kicks in at about 2000 RPM. There is turbo lag. But when you're driving in the city or out on the highway, you have this mild hybrid assistance, which completely masks that turbo lag. It's only when you're climbing hills, like we were doing a little while back, that is when the low end starts feeling sluggish. That is when you need to get this engine revving up beyond two and a half, three thousand 3000 RPM to get going, to pull the kind of luggage and to pull the kind of capacity that we were taking along all through this drive. But apart from that, I think this engine is quite good. It's made it to a six-speed manual transmission. The clutch, not too heavy, quite light, doesn't have that springy action. It's also got a very light travel, a very small travel for its clutch pedal. So driving it in the city is not a problem at all. The only fly in the ointment is you cannot have this engine with an automatic transmission if you want the mild hybrid assistance. If you want the automatic, you get it with pure petrol propulsion. We didn't get an opportunity to drive the petrol auto, which comes with a dual clutch transmission, but the manual was pretty impressive. Currently, neither of the powertrains in the Hector are BS6 compatible in order to keep the launch price low. But the smaller tyre and wheel sizes have allowed the Hector to have respectable fuel economy and lower emissions, claims MG. The diesel variant is a tried and tested Fiat Multijet 2 engine. Same engine that powers the Compass, same engine that also goes in the Harrier. But the power figures, they are comparable to that of the Compass. So you get 170 PS of power, 350 Newton meters of torque. That's exactly the Compass territory. But compared to the Compass, this engine feels slightly more noisy. And that's not down to the engine, but to the noise insulation. So both in petrol and in diesel, you feel that engine sound filling into the cabin from as low as 2000 RPM. For the petrol, you can also hear the turbocharging, you can hear the transmission whines, and in the diesel, that gravelly note of the diesel is evident all through the rev range. If you were to discount that, the road noise insulation of this car is quite good. The diesel variant will certainly be the volume generator with its better all-down performance. The manual gearbox on the diesel has a heavy clutch like the one seen on the Compass and it gets cumbersome in the city environment. But the engine in the Hector is tuned for better low end than the Compass, making urban driving slightly more convenient. There's no option of a diesel automatic yet, but the same BSX powertrain from the Compass Trailhawk could join the lineup next year with the 7-seater variant. An all-wheel drive variant has been ruled out for the Indian market though. So the way the Hector is priced and positioned, it will go up against cars like the Jeep Compass, the Mahindra XUV 500, the Hyundai Tucson to an extent, the Tata Hexa, the Tata Harrier. Now the Jeep Compass, it's not everyone's cup of tea and someone who wants a Compass probably doesn't look elsewhere. But the larger chunk of audience in that segment is essentially looking for something that is spacious, something that looks imposing, something that in a way shows that you have arrived. It's sort of a signature of power. And on all those respects, the Hector actually scores high points and ticks all the right boxes to be able to compete with the Harrier, the Hexa or even the XV500. So the Harrier, the way it's priced and positioned and packaged, that is going to be its primary rival and that is going to be its primary nightmare as well. At the same time, the XV500 and the Hexa, these cars are aging and that is where the MG Hector has a big opportunity. It is bringing to the table something that is unique to the segment. It is bringing a lot of connected technology to the table as well. And it looks quite good. At the same time, SAIC is putting all its learnings into practice that it has had with, the, with their stint with GM India. So they are ensuring that their sales and support network is strong right from day one to ensure a better peace of mind for its customers. So even though the customers are investing in a new product and technically in a new car brand altogether, there's still a lot of experience that is coming with it that should ensure a better peace of mind. 
So all these things considered, I think the Hector has a lot going for it. And in that sense, this is a car that you should definitely consider if you're making a decision to buy a car in this particular space.